Trees, they need to be robust and they need to be able to adapt to changes. That has always been the case and it is certainly the case with uh, global change that involve uh, change of climate but also involve new pests and pathogens. And it's definitely the, definitely the challenge of... Um, okay. <clears throat> <laughs> it's definitely a challenge of, um, of ash that is being now being, is that okay or? Maybe it's better. <laughs> okay. That is being challenged by uh, uh, the fungus called Hymnoscyphus fractioneus. This is a, it's a fungus that is native to, uh, to Asia, but it's used to Europe. It sporulates on the, on the dead petioles from last year. The spores will uh, infect the leaves uh, during the growing season. Um, then uh, when the leaves fall off, the, the, the fungus will spread on the dead leaves and next year it will, um, it will sporulate on, on dead leaves. This is a cycle of the, of the fungus on its native host in Asia and it's also the cycle of the na on, the, on European ash. Unfortunately, on European ash it also has a different behavior. It will infect through the, the branches into the stem and thereby cause necrosis and, uh, and, and can kill the trees. Um, there's an important point to that because we don't see the, we very rarely see spoliation on this damaged part. And that means that most likely it's, it doesn't, the fitness of the fungus will not depend on the ability to be a pathogen. It can actually try very well just living as it does on its native host. And there's an implication for that because we think that possible would then be that even though if we introduce tolerant trees into the forest, this will not trigger selection on the pathogen. Um, we looked to the, a bit into that, and there's a paper by our colleague um, uh, Chachai Kusavang that actually managed to identify some uh, sp uh, isolates out there that are not pathogenic. And I'll speak about that, but the reason why it's interesting is because we do see trees of European ash that are not uh, ex exposing, showing uh, symptoms when they're infected by the fungus. This is an example on the left. We have progenies uh, here that look completely healthy, or almost healthy, even though most of the trees are being damaged. And the same for, for in, the, in, the, in the right panel, see clones. We observed that early when we start to study this pandemic in uh, 2007 8 And that led us to, to the conclusion, and we made this review in 2013, the ash by crisis, genetic variation and resistance can prove a long-term solution. Uh, and also we uh, was based on estimating huge abilities. Now it's 10 years ago and uh, we could ask, was that a, a bold, was it too bold to conclude that or is it still a valid perspective? And that's basically what I will cover during this talk. Uh, so the question are the, the, these extreme uh, phenotypes we saw, are they still uh, healthy or are they starting to get uh, show symptoms? Uh, and when we go into a forest, can we see, still see trees which are, are healthy there, or are the health still declining with increased mortality? Or put differently, will there be enough trees to survive that actually will allow us to, uh, for the, 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 the ash to remain in the long run? And coming to resilience, so back to the Red Queen, uh, will the health recover due to selection? Because, because uh, there will be selection against the, the genotypes with low uh, the low fitness, or you could say, in, in favor of, of, of uh, the dune sites with high um, crowd tolerance. Um, or would we see a case where this very strong mortality would lead to bottlenecks that could cause uh, loss of diversity and inbreeding? And of course, finally, um, how can we support this uh, directly founded uh, resilience if it's there? Okay, the first question, do we still see these, uh, these phenotypes remaining healthy? This is uh, uh, on, the, on the left, you see the development of uh, 39 clones from 2007 to 2013, and each line represents one clone. And, and, and the lower part, we see, we see the clone number 35 uh, on the one picture that actually remained healthy. And today, yes, it's still healthy. So we can still find these healthy trees there. Um, so. With the same would go for the progeny trials. We saw progenies that were uh, much more healthy than average, and we still see that. Um, we do see some tendency to, uh, to, uh, 
uh, that the disease actually is developing, so there's a, um, a, and we do see some mortality, but uh, the main fraction remains. Now, I could talk a lot about this genetic studies and breeding so on. I'll not do that because there's a, a poster session on the breeding of ash, and, and there'll be a good opportunity to discuss it there. Um, I will instead go to this robust business, what actually happened in the, what happened in the forest. Um, and we have been serving eight populations since 2010. Each of these populations, there are 50 trees, and they are, uh, we know the origin, so it's a similar origin, but different sites. It's published recently, uh, the paper, I thought we should call the paper, when will they die and will they all die? Uh, but uh, Cody, that was the first author, and the co-author thought it was better to call it Combined Progress in Symptoms Caused by Hymnoscubus fractionius and Amelia Species and Corresponding Mortality in Young and Old Trees. So that's basically what it's about. Just to say here that also we look on the interaction with other, the secondary pathogens. I'll not talk about that. I'll show the slide. This is uh, uh, two of the populations, um, population that was about um, uh, 40 to 45 years old when, they were, uh, when the disease hit uh, Denmark. Uh, there are um, two different sites, uh, on the road, and the dark blue is the, the percentage which are uh, completely healthy. Then you have the, sorry, the, the, the dark green is completely healthy, the light green is have some symptoms, the yellow is damaged, and, and so on. And the, the, the black one is dead. So if you follow the panel, you can see so the development over time uh, that more and more trees uh, get unhealthy and we have mortality. And you can also see on the, the slides that they are different between two sites. Uh, the L sites, uh, we have uh, much more healthy trees than, um, uh, than on the other side, which is uh, right behind on Sealand. So if you look at the, at the young, the one, the young trials, uh, the young uh, forests with the same, same origin, we can see that their mortality happened much faster. Um, and in uh, and, and 2000, and, uh, we actually have the, the most recent dates. I just got, got them uh, last week. I didn't insert them there. But we can see this development continue. But what we also can see continuous is that this fraction of, of trees that actually are healthy, they are still healthy. So we still have a, a few percent of the trees that, uh, that, remain, that remain healthy, um, even after these years. So that is, uh, that's, of course, good news. Um, then one could say, I mean, there's actually still the majority are unhealthy. So we could expect that, of course, also the unhealthy trees with fusel of seed, pollen and seed, and found the next generation. So the question would be, is it the really the healthy trees that, uh, that, that found the next generation, or do we see a situation where it could be actually be the unhealthy that, that have more fruit set? Um, that could be one concern. Another concern could be if there's too few trees, it could create a big bottleneck. Okay, so for example, what would happen in 2014? Uh, will it be the healthy or unhealthy? Actually, we have an eyewitness. Because in 2014, Devrin uh, uh, Cummings went out there and actually looked who's actually sighing the, 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 the next generation and exactly this forest in, uh, in Valby. So you can see this was where they, we had all kind of uh, health status. Some, some trees were dead at the time and some were healthy. Uh, and this is uh, here on, on, on the pie chart. You can see the distribution of uh, the, the dead and the more or less healthy. The green ones are the ones which are completely healthy or almost healthy, and, and the yellow one is, I mean, they are infected, but they still probably will, will survive. So, so again, looking at the, uh, the, this black arrow, and then we have the pie chart. So actually, Devrin, she sampled more trees out in the forest, not only the survey stands, and then she tried to look at the offspring, who has been signed then by using uh, punch analysis. And here you see, on the left, you see the, the situation of the, of the parents, and on, on, on the right, you see the situation of, the, of who's, who's actually been siring the offspring. And it, you can see that the healthy and the almost healthy trees are certainly overrepresented as parents. So we do see a situation that it's the healthy trees that produce the majority of offspring. Still, there's many unhealthy trees out there, so we also have uh, them as, as parents. Now, then was the question about the bottleneck, and, uh, and Devrim also looked into that. And uh, just to, for the purpose of time, I do this short. This is just showing the estimation of the, the dispersal of seed and pollen. Of course, there's a lot of, uh, of uh, work before that, but based on the genotyping and, uh, and the modeling, together with good colleagues in, in Poland, this is, uh, shows the, this, this, the seed dispersal. And the 
conclusion would be that 90% of the seed was dispersed less than 120 meters so. Or put differently, 10% of the seed was dispersed more than 120 meters. So that means that, I mean, seed are dispersed over very long distances, and definitely, even though if you are high mortality, seed can't be dis dispersed between any two uh, healthy trees. When it comes to the pollen dispersal, of course, pollen is dispersed very long distances. We would, we would know that uh, from other studies. But so the conclusion would be something like um, a single healthy tree can actually uh, spread seed over long distances, covering areas between healthy trees. Uh, pollen uh, dispersed will really connect, so we could have like one big palmitic population. Um, and also, if we make enrichment plantings, that would actually that would actually allow uh, seed uh, and also pollen to spread into old growth. This is an interesting discussion because if we have uh, some old growth forest, then actually planting healthy trees could actually spread their genes into the populations. Um, then, of course, you could say the trees out there that, that look healthy, uh, do they also have the genes for, for tolerance? Uh, I mean, what kind of, what kind of in seed herd species do you have? Uh, a tree will look he healthy out there, but is it really healthy? I mean, in terms of, of breeding value. And we don't any, have any data for that. I mean, there are people working on that in our group, uh, uh, Lena Rosker Nielsen, together with colleagues in Norway, trying to estimate this in situ herdsability. But we still have some data. And that's because, actually, actually uh, as part of the work to, to recover the health of the ash forest, we, together with the foresters, uh, the forest owners and the, the state forest, actually made some selection. So people identified healthy trees, and they were collected and they were grafted and put into seed orchards. Some were selected as very young trees, uh, as you can see on the left, and some was collected in old growth, in the much older forest. That means that actually now we have these uh, uh, clones uh, propagated and planted in a trial, and, uh, and we have results on that. Uh, so here each dot would represent one clone, and, uh, and we have here the health score. So if you look up, you can see some which are completely uh, unhealthy and some which are very healthy. Uh, on the left, you have the ones that were selected as young trees, and on, on the right, the one that's selected as mature trees. Um, I should say that uh, this was, trial was established before we had this very dry 2018, so a lot of this variation is, is due to very hot, hot conditions. But we have, go back to the tree, this tree number 35, that actually was, was doing very, very well. This is also part of the trial, so we have like a golden standard. This is the health status of this tree. So we could say this, if it is as healthy or more healthy than the number 35, it's actually a tree with a deal type with quite good tolerance. And that means that amongst the young selected trees, uh, actually 50% of the trees, almost half of the trees, would actually be as healthy or more healthy than this uh, genotype, and uh, when it goes to the old one, it's less, it's 25. So that means that uh, many of the trees out there, they look healthy, I mean, they are not genetically disposed for high health, but the majority are, and, uh, and definitely uh, there's a selection in favor of that. So just to conclude on the resilience, I mean, uh, the first could be that breeding for low susceptible trees uh, and either as planting or as treatments is actually seems to be a viable option, and again, we we'll come back to discussion that in the poster session. Um, but also we see that the, the ASDAPA create uh, high mortality, and that leads to selections against susceptible. And uh, we see that the healthy produce more offspring, so we have both psychotic and sexual selection in favor of more uh, tolerance. Uh, not all the healthy trees um, actually are genetically protected, but, but a large fraction is. So that, and also we see the selection uh, is probably most effective amongst young trees. So I could, I could end the talk here, but uh, i just say a few words more about the last issue that we see that, that um, the selection is most effective amongst the young trees. Because when people plant forests, they plant a lot of trees, and of course only some of these trees will grow up to become mature. Um, and we see that in the trials, this is one of the trials, this is the data is published by uh, Albin Lobo, uh, back uh, on uh, where we have study on mortality, paper in Scandinavian Journal, and you can see the trees look quite awful, there's a lot of mortality, but if you come back 10 years later, it still is like an ash forest. That's a closed canopy, so even though most trees died, actually the main trees actually were able to, to, to to, to, to manage to make a canopy. And this leads into the discussion that ash is actually a tree that a forest that would uh, do strong thinning. It's, it's a tree that is light, light demanding. So what one, the forest that would do thinning, and here, and this is a curve, we try to make some simulations based on growth model. It's, it's a forest model called Silva uh, that actually predict how uh, grows will, forest will, how forest stands will grow depending on, on, the, on the stem, number of stem and thinning regimes. 
And in the red color is uh, what could be scenario one, which could be how normally a, a normal asphalt would grow. So, uh, so there will be uh, maybe something like 3,000 uh, uh, trees per hectare at age uh, 20, and then they'll be thinning, and then they'll follow the red curve. Now, uh, the green curve could be what we'll see in a case with a lot of ash die back, 90% of trees will die. And uh, what we see here on, on the, the uh, wire axis is, is what one measure is like the volume per, uh, in the remaining stand. So we can see definitely this is not uh, developing as a normal ash forest. But if we try to zoom in and look at some of the scenarios, we can see here that, that if we had like uh, 2,000 trees per hectare, or so 1,000 trees per hectare, at least 2,000 trees per hectare, we could probably see a development which is not very different from what we could see in, in, a, in a today planted ash forest. So our point would be that if, as long as we have like uh, 2,000 he healthy trees per hectare, which would be maybe something like 60% of the trees should have this high level of tolerance, then most likely we could, uh, we could see this development. Okay, so that would be, so that actually would be, you could ask, is, 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 this, is, this, is it possible, could we actually uh, obtain uh, uh, seed sources with kind of tolerance? We'll come back to that in post session, we can discuss that. But just to say, to finish off, I'll say, of course, we need to understand the ecology. I mean, we need to understand more about the genes. In our group, it's James, James Dunn is trying to understand the genes. There'll be a presentation by Richard Box also about uh, finding the genes behind the uh, tolerance. There's an issue about the endophytes. Many people look at the, the endophytes as embryons, and uh, this is uh, just work shown by our, our colleague, um, Chacha Kusavang. And what I don't want, I want you to see is the colors below. So these are different clones, and the colors are different, just indicating that different genotypes actually have different endophytic societies. And in the top, you can see that actually endophytes differs between spring and autumn. Uh, and, uh, and we will work a lot to try to understand the, the difference between the, the microbiome implantations versus forest. So all these things, just to say all these things, we need to, uh, to, to work with that if we want to do some active management for resilient forest. And uh, my point would be that the lower part, the, the last sentence here, you know, this actually requires a lot of cooperation between silviculture, forest pathology, microbiology, and ecophysiology uh, to order to, to, to give these guidelines. And I think that is the, the kind of cooperation that we need. Uh, so thanks to, main, I mean, there are many co-authors and co-funders and that actually have been supporting uh, our research on ash. I mean, this is just some of the funding agencies. Um, and I didn't put the name of all our co-workers, but these are people at some at picture, at least some of them, you can see here in the middle, it's uh, Leah with McKinney, who did a lot of the work. You can also see Katja, that actually also participated in saving the ash when she was there. Uh, and on the, um, uh, on the right, you can see uh, some of the researchers from our research group, uh, the Red Queens running as fast as we can to save the ash forest. Yeah, thank you. Yes, thank you, Eric Dahl, for a very interesting talk. Um, I guess there are some questions. Yes, I expected that. Um, please, um, Bertolt. <coughs> Hello, Eric. Can you see me behind the lamp? <laughs> yeah, I can, yeah. Uh, I was just wondering if there's such a high mortality. Do you think that over the years, and you have compared uh, data over, over more than 10 years, there could be less and less spores in the air because there's less ash trees and less leaves? Yeah, I mean, what, what we see in the, yeah, anyway, in the trials, I mean, th there are still many trees that are dying. So definitely we see a lot of spores there. Uh, but there's a, I mean, it's a very important discussion about what happens if you go outside the forest. I skipped the discussion about the abiotic factors, but that's definitely important to look at the abiotic factors. And so, so there, there's something there. But I think what the studies that the, the, the stands we've been following is heavily infected, and we see, but there are other stands which are, Less infected, but maybe you have a point. We see some leveling off of the infection pressure, but but not in these things. So yeah, okay, please up there. Hi, Eric. Uh, thanks for your optimistic view on ash. Um, I was wondering um, your offspring trial. Um, can you observe? Uh, do you know the health status of the parents or of the mother? And can you observe that healthy trees produce more healthy offsprings? Is there, have you observed some yeah, connection? 
for these for these trials, we cannot because they were selected in 2001, and we don't we cannot really find the, 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 the I mean we cannot we cannot do that. But we have some studies because well, there's another study we published in, in Scandinavian Journal. I mean, first pathology. We actually we can do that because we know the clones, the mother clones, and we have the offspring. So uh, they, it's a small sample size, but there we do see a uh, positive correlation. And we had to do some control crosses also uh, that we also see this. So we do see this correlation. It's not a perfect correlation. So definitely there's something going on. And, and that will hope, hopefully that's the, the, the take home message. It's a bit more complicated than simply uh, the genes. So we have to look at the interaction. But yes, in, in general, we see this kind of correlation. And definitely we see when we take the, take the trees and, and graft them and put them into the, the clone trash, we can see this uh, correlation. I didn't show the data, but we have some data on that also, where we look onto the audit with the, with the graftings. I actually have the data, but I'm sure I'll not be allowed to show it. <laughs> Thank you for the talk. You said clone number 35 looks healthy. Um, do you see the same clone planted in different location, have the same pattern of healthiness? Yeah. And how old uh, the, the clone is right now? Yeah. So I have a hard time actually thinking how I should pronounce it because working with false pathologies, whether it's tolerant or resistant or so on. But it actually, we see the leaves are being infected by the fungus, but so we tolerate the infection. So I, I prefer to come tolerance. And excuse me for any uh, false pathologies are present. Now, we've been testing these also on different sites. So we don't see GBI. It's, uh, there's a very clear expression. So these have been tested on different sites, and we see the same pattern. We don't see any GBI. Thank you. My question was basically also related to the same clone, to the, your golden standard number 35. I was wondering um, if you see that this uh, seems to be tolerant if you have already tested in order um, to, to do some controlled crosses with this clone or so if you see the, that the, the, the offspring is also more tolerant and yeah. How you see the future. Yeah, we're basically control trosses, and yes, we we see we see that they are more tolerant. But yeah. uh, but that it, it is. I mean, it is. This is a talk by itself because it is a bit complicated. But in general, yes, with oh, with the bots, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, but this is only one clone. Now, of course, as you saw, we actually have a, a large number of clones, and there are also genotypes collected in other in, uh, in other groups. So now there's a big uh, diversity panel that have been used for doing GVAS. And I think a lot of interesting results are coming out of that now, these days, trying to understand the genes behind. Again, that would be another talk about, but Richard will touch, I suppose, touch a bit about, you know, the genes which are involved in, in the tolerance. And that's also complicated. So I'm pretty sure there's a lot to discuss the next day. So um, we have to go further. Thank you very much again, Eric Dahl. Thank you.